Okay, so first I want to thank Jacob for organizing this. I think it's really going to be a, a gas. I'm really looking forward to Lydia's talk and to, and to Vina's talk. Uh, before I get started, I, I want to say just, uh, um, I think two, I have two prefatory remarks. One is that um, for those of y'all who have seen me give talks before in person, you know that I, I tend to like to walk around and you know, gesture a lot and, and I can't do that very easily right now. So you, I'll probably be swinging in my, swinging back and forth in my chair like this to make up for that. I hope that's not too distracting. Second, um, what was second? Right, second. Second was that I added several slides at the last minute this afternoon and I was thinking about how, to, how I wanted to say things and going over things in my mind and couldn't really decide how, I, I, I didn't really have time to say things more briefly. So the last few slides are big text dumps for which I apologize. Maybe next time I give this talk, I will have had time to pare it down to something uh, more aesthetically pleasing and more manageable. So, singularities in classical and semi-classical gravity, theory failure or groovy new physics. I, th I, I think by the end of the talk, you'll see where I, where I come down. Oh, I guess I will say, I do have one more prefatory remark, which is that I will utter the, the phrase black hole very few times during this talk, but I hope it should be clear to everyone that this talk is that the subject of this talk is intimately related to the almost every problem that comes up in studying and thinking about black holes. Also, I guess there's gonna, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between talking about fairly basic uh, matters and fairly sophisticated matters. So if you feel a bit of, of whiplash, I apologize for that. I, I just I don't know a way to, to do anything different in 45 minutes. Okay, let's actually get started on the talk itself, except, oh, there we go, good. Okay, so I'll begin by giving a, a brief overview of what singularities are in classical general rel relativity, just to get just to you know, get everyone in the mood, so to speak. And you know, uh, I, I, I always think that one should give a talk in accord with Fermi's pleasure principle, which, you know, which says that should never underestimate the pleasure an audience derives from hearing what it already knows. So I hope that this part of the talk, most, most of you will already have a very good grip on. There, there won't be too many surprises. I'll start getting a little more provocative, I think, by the end of that section. And by the time I get to cosmic censorship and determinism, I'll probably, at least a few, a few of you will start getting enraged, I hope. By the time I, I hit singularities in cosmic censorship and semi-classical gravity, I, I suspect and hope at least half of you will be enraged. And by the end of breakdown of theory or groovy new physics, I hope all of you will be enraged. That's my goal. Okay, so a singularity in a relativistic space-time, I won't say that it is an incomplete and incidental world line, but that at least is a marker of a singularity, whatever exactly a singularity may be. It's just a hard fact of life in a big relativistic city that sometimes world lines just end after a finite period of, let's say, proper time for a time-lock curve. And when I say they just end, I mean that they have no future endpoint in the space-time. They cannot be extended in the space-time and the space-time itself cannot be extended. There is no event at which the incomplete curves terminate. And so some people want to talk about a breakdown in space-time geometry. They use, they use phrases like that. It's never clear to me exactly what that means uh, for reasons I'll get into later. But one way to make the idea of an incomplete and extendable uh, time-like curve, let's say, vivid, is to think of the experience an observer whose world line was that curve would have, what, what experience an observer would have. That, that observer would experience only a finite length of, of time for his or her existence, but the observer would never die, not necessarily, let's say, that. that that the, that the curve did not in fact run into a region of, of a curvature blow up, which can happen. The, the observer would never die and the observer would never cease to exist. It's simply the case that any clock, say the observer held, would never tick more than five times. It's 
for most people, I think, when they try to get their minds around this for the first time, it's rather unsettling. This, this idea of an incomplete and extendable curve um, is used as the basis for what John Ehrman, I think, I think he called it the quasi-official definition, if I recall correctly, in his magisterial book, um, Bangs, Crunch, Bangs, Crunches, Whimpers, and Shrieks, Singularities and Eight Causalities in Relative Space Space Times. You know, actually, really kind of think of it. If, if y'all have, if, if haven't read that book, you're probably better off just like leaving this talk and going to read that book. You'll probably get more out of it. But if you're going to stay with this talk, then you should go read the book immediately after the workshop. So the idea of an incomplete and extendable world line led Garoche and Penrose and Hawking in the 60s with their class um, to use this. They used this idea to prove their classic singularity theorems, the ones that we now revere rightly so, but it was never exactly clear and it was never settled certainly whether a singular, whether we should consider the incomplete and extendable curve itself to be a singularity or whether the singularity was something else, curvature blow up, incompleteness of the, of the space time, something like that. There was a whole long, there's a whole big debate about this, what exactly singularity is. But for our purposes, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to take a singularity to be, at least when no, no problem or question specifically turns on the question of the definition, when, the, when, nothing, when nothing else turns on it, I will use this definition as for what I mean by singularity or singular structure. A singularity in a space-time that satisfies some maximality condition. So the, the space-time is already in a sense as big as it can possibly be. You can't, ex you can't from the beginning, so to speak, extend the space time further. A, sing a singularity is an inextendable causal curve that is incomplete with respect to some measure of its length. Where I put length in square scare quotes because there are many different, several different ways uh, one can try to capture that idea in a more or less physically significant way. When you have a time like curve, proper time is very often the most natural, but not always, in fact. So it's this definition though places almost no substantive constraint on the nature of the physical properties of space times in which these things can occur, as we will see. So here are some examples. You know, take your favorite space time, you know, Minkowski space time, and delete from it a shape, a set in the shape of Ingrid Bergman. Now that seems like cheating because of course you have every curve that ran into the points where you know, that, that, made, that made up the Ingrid Bergman shaped set, every curve that ran into, that, that runs into the empty hole, so to speak, is incomplete and inextendable in that space time. But it seems like cheating because we can very easily remove the problem by simply sticking the removed points back into the Minkowski space time. There's no, there's no reason to remove them in the first place. There's actually quite a lot to say about why I think what I just said about why this kind of example seems like cheating, why I think that actually that is not a very strong response. But it's the, tip, it's, it's the typical standard response and it would take us too far afield in this talk to go into it. So I'll, I'll put it aside. A second example is say the blow up of space-time curvature in gravitational collapse. There is some sense in which people want to say the metric loses definition at R equals zero at the origin. Say, um, you know, Oppenheimer Schneider, you know, spher spherically symmetric cloud of dust collapsing to, uh, collapsing to its central point, uh, you eventuating in uh, something like a Schwarzschild singularity. Then there are even weirder examples that where one, you can have a, an incomplete and extendable curve in a space time where the incomplete and extendable curve is entirely contained within a compact region, a compact subset in the interior of space time with no surgery, like you don't excise sets in the shape of a Bergman, no pathology and curvature, no, no measure of curvature blows up. In fact, you can have it, you can, uh, have it be such that all curvature and all curvature scalar invariants identically vanish everywhere in the space time. And you still have complete incomplete and extendable curves. So Tom nut space time is an example. Some colliding, some colliding plane gravitational wave space times give examples. I'll show you a nice picture in a moment. And the classic you know, singularity theorems of Penrose, Garoche, and Hawking from the 60s 
show us that the existence of these incomplete inextendable curves is entirely generic across enormous families of otherwise what we would think of as well-behaved space times. So general relativity presents us with this problem, if you like, the prediction of the, of the completely generic prediction of what seems on the face of it to be somehow or other a pathological behavior. But when you actually try to put your finger on exactly what is pathological about it, it becomes very tricky. So here's a nice picture of Meisner's um, wonderful two-dimensional model of Todd Nutt space-time. The image is taken from Hawking and Ellis, 1973. And if you look at, um, at the, the, the spiral curve, so the, the, the curve coming up from the bottom that begins to wind around the cylinder faster and faster and faster and bunches up at t equals zero is actually a null geodesic. And it, it is incomplete and inextendable. You cannot extend it past t equals zero. But any time like geodesic that just goes straight at the cylinder passes right through t equals zero, no problem. There's no curvature pathology anywhere in, anywhere in, in, in the in the vicinity. T equals zero, by the way, is actually a, um, a, closed, null, a closed null curve. So th the space time violates uh, causality. So what are the physical problems? Some of the physical problems that these, that the existence of these inextendable and complete curves give rise to is first of all, general relativity is time reversible. If you give me a space time with a time orientation, and stuff you know, runs from past to future, well, if I just turn that space time upside down and run things from what had been past to what had been future, that's a perfectly good relativistic space time. So in other words, if we have space times that have incomplete and ensemble curves for the future, say stuff collapsing into a Schwarzschild singularity, you know, a spherical cloud of dust like Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Schneider collapsing to a, a central Schwarzschild singularity, well, just turn that frown upside down and you get a Schwarzschild singularity that's just cruising along happily for some finite period of time. And then as far as you can tell, for no reason whatsoever, it just explodes into a spherical cloud of dust that expands outward. It's a perfectly good relativistic space time. Um, it's actually funny to read when, when people started, people really started arguing about this and thinking about this in the late 60s. It was all physicists back then who were, who were doing this. You, would, you read the funniest arguments. You read these guys, and they were all guys back then, reading, you, you, you read these guys making arguments, trying to rule out the kind of, the kind of situation I, I, I just described by invoking what in effect was what Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason. Well, there, there's nothing could cause that kind of behavior. There could be no reason why the singularity would just, you know, would cruise along for five minutes and then explode rather than cruising along for six minutes and then exploding. It, it, it's, it's hilarious to read these physicists basically reinvent, reinventing Leibniz without even realizing it. They're, they're, they're like a, a Mo, you know, Mo, Mo, Moliere's monsieur you know, sp speaking prose without realizing it, without knowing it. So that's one problem. Another problem is, again, th that there's no known physical mechanism according to any of our best laws that could cause such a thing going forward or backward in time. Something that's a little looser and more difficult to formulate precisely, and I'll discuss this later, is uh, it's not clear that we, know to, we don't know how to formulate laws when space and geometry loses its definition, say when curvature blows up. One other problem is that it's not actually really clear what the physical significance of curvature uh, pathology is. It really seems like it should be. But in fact, when you begin to look at the details, what physical effects curvature pathology has can very sensitively depend on the state of motion of the observer probing, probing the space-time geometry. It, it's really fascinating. Then there are issues such as uh, such you know, space times can be time like complete, and by that I mean they can be time uh, every single ge every single time like geodesic is complete. None of them are incomplete. None of them are you, you have no time like single, no uh, time like curve that ends after a finite period of proper time and cannot be extended. But null incomplete it has no it has incomplete null geodesics and vice versa. It's very difficult to see how to understand this physically. Also, space times can be entirely geodesically. Entirely, entirely geodesically complete, 
but have incomplete time-like curves that bound to total acceleration. So every, free, every freely falling observer can live forever. But if I give you a rocket with a finite amount of fuel, you can run yourself, in, you can run yourself into one of these uh, singular curves and live only for a finite period of time. Then there are what, for lack of a better term, I will call philosophical problems. Although I personally don't make much of a distinction in this, in, in this very rarefied reg physical regime between the, the physics and the philosophy. There are a plethora of definitions. The canonical one I gave is not the only one for what counts as a singularity. Is there such a thing as the single correct definition? If not, what is the relation among all the viable definitions? Are they different explications of the same concept? As I intimated earlier, there's a serious ambiguity in um, how in the idea of a curve of a finite length. There are many different notions of length that are used here to define incompleteness and they give different results. According to some, which seem very natural, one space time will be singular, but according to another, which also seems very natural, the space time is not singular. The choice of reference, so I, I remarked that these results depend on, in some sense, the force of these results depend on assuming from the start that the, that the, that the curves in the space time are not incomplete simply because one didn't make the space time as big as one could have to start with, that the space time is maximal. And that leads to some interesting subtleties about what, what the reference class of space times with respect to which the space time is maximal. What it, it, when I say that the space time isn't as big as it could have been, we can expand it to make you know, turn it into a bigger space time. Well, you have to tell me what are the possible space times we're considering here that, it, that it, we can expand it into. And there are some really uh, beautiful papers by uh, Manchak and by uh, Yulia Stavashevsky, who I believe is here in, this talk, in the audience, as it were, about this issue. And there's the issue of existence. Uh, er, er, Ehrman, uh, I, er, Ehrman, uh, Ehrman calls this the, er, the Aristotelian maxim, if I recall correctly. To exist is to exist in space and time. Well, the incompleteness of curves don't exist. There's no point at which the curves end. So what sort of existence should we attribute to singularities? Do they, in fact, herald the breakdown of determinism, as my example of the upside down Schwarzschild singularity might suggest? Do they indicate the breakdown of general relativity as a physical theory, as I'll discuss later? And perhaps most, uh, most poignantly, in all of these arguments, when we're trying to, trying to come up with answers to all of these questions, what do we have to go on besides the, the intuitions of eminent physicists, which by and large, if you just look at the sociology of the, discussion, of the arguments and discussions about singularity since the 60s, it really, has, it really is the case that the, that the intuitions of a very few eminent influential physicists have dominated and shaped and guided the debate in when people address, address these questions and try and answer them. Should we trust them? Why? I mean, sure, they're, you know, they're smart guys. We should listen to them. But it seems to me at least a little bit dangerous, maybe too strong a word, but problematic to have the debate so entirely shaped by the deliverances of a very few people. I think at bottom, one of the, the re, I honestly believe after having talked with a lot of people about this over many, many years and read, read a bunch of papers and almost every, at bottom, people who get really freaked out by singularities and most, most physicists who want to efface them say by invoking quantum gravity, when you really talk to them, you can, you can see this kind of uh, anxiety that, uh, rising up and taking over you know, and, 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 and taking them over when they think about singularities, they want, they want to make sure, they want to get rid of them. They, they, they want them not to be there. And I think a lot of it honestly is psychological. And I think that uh, Vladimir Nabokov in his novel, in his novel Ada really captures the heart of the idea of why, of, of why these things freak people out so much. The man of, the, the man of mind, the mind of man by nature a monist cannot accept two nothings. He knows there has been one nothing, his biological inexistence in the infinite past, for his memory is utterly blank. And that nothingness, being as it were past, is not too hard to endure. 
But a second nothingness, which perhaps might, might not be so hard to bear either, is logically unacceptable. He was, Nab, Nabokov, of course, was talking about death, but I think the lesson carries over. So cosmic censorship and determinism. By 1969, um, Penrose and Gurich and Hawking had, proven, had proved a slew of singularity theorems showing that according to general relativity that these incomplete inextendable causal curves will show up in almost any space time you can throw a rock at. This Penrose realized very quickly that this might cause some serious problems. And so infamously in 1969, he proposed what has come to be known as the cosmic censorship hypothesis. I'll quote from that paper. Even if the no hair theorem or something like it is true, have we any right to suggest that the only type of collapse which can occur is one in which the space-time singularities lie hidden deep inside the protective shielding of an absolute event horizon? Just as an aside, just as an aside I'll remark that what Penrose means by absolute event horizon is what we would call an event horizon today. The terminology was still being worked out. In fact, if I recall correctly, Penrose doesn't even use the term black hole in this paper. If not, it would be possible for information to escape from the singularity of the outside world. In short, the singularity is visible in all its nakedness to the outside world. We are thus presented with what is perhaps the most fundamental unanswered question of general relativistic collapse theory. Namely, does there exist a cosmic sensor who forbids the appearance of naked singularities, clothing each one in an absolute event horizon? Now, the, fir the, the first thing that one has, the, the most immediately and immediately obvious, the most immediately obvious thing to say about this is it's cosmic censorship, no matter what else it is or what else it may be, can't just be there are no naked singularities because there's a naked singularity in our universe. We can see it, the Big Bang. So there are two responses to this. One is refine what one means by naked singularities so that you can kind of divide them into two classes, the, un the unproblematic naked singularities like the Big Bang and the problematic naked singularities that require clothing, the ones whose you know, whose lewdness demand, de demands the, you know, some, some enforced modesty. And exactly what that lewdness is of the problematically naked singularities uh, we'll, we'll try and work out in a moment. The second response is to provide necessary and sufficient conditions for cosmic censorship in general, independent of the idea of a naked singularity. In the modern impetus, um, really starting, starting with Penrose and being developed ever more um, explicitly and elaborately for cosmic censorship is to ensure that general relativity embodies some form of determinism or predictability to enable us to continue to practice physics as we know it, whatever exactly that might mean. The idea is that if, if that singularities represent, especially collapse singularities, the ones where curvature does blow up, and that's, it seems necessarily, they seem to in, they seem to represent or indicate or mark or embody or some some verb like that, a breakdown in the fundamental structure of space time so severe that it could wreak havoc anywhere the singularity were visible. But remember, not all naked singularities do that because, you know, big bang. The structures that break down are the, exactly those that are required for the formulation of known physical laws. And in particular, the structures that are required to formulate initial value problems, which is mostly by and large how we do physics, ignoring boundary, you know, you can kind of assimilate boundary value problems in there too. So without some kind of, without some form of cosmic uh, censorship, Penrose worried and people immediately began to worry along with him. Determinism and predictability, perhaps the possibility of physics as we know it would collapse wherever the pathology were causally visible. In Ehrman's wonderful 
wonderful conceit. If we could see you know, a, a naked, there's no way to predict what could come out of a naked singularity. Just again, th think of the of the upside down Schwarzschild collapse. And if, but of course, you know, stuff that anything can collapse to form a singularity, not just a cloud of dust. You could have an enormous cloud of old socks or an enormous cloud of TVs playing Nixon's checker speech that could collapse to form a singularity, which means, and since that's a perfectly well, well behaved, well defined relativistic space time, so is the time reverse. You could have a singular, you could have a singularity just cruising along and all of a sudden explode into a gazillion TVs playing Nixon's checker speech. Which is problematic not only for the reasons of the breakdown of determinism, but who wants to see you know, a gazillion copies of Nixon giving his checker speech. So how can we rule this out? Can we rule this out in any principled way? Well, that leads to the problem that there are in fact many, trying to nail down exactly what it is you wanna preserve is, is hard. There are many forms of determinism and they can all fail in different ways in GR it turns out. And again, I urge you to go read the Ehrman and, and, and Ulysses papers about this. So in order to try to, 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 to nail down the idea of constant censorship, to make it precise enough to um, admit of something like a proof, uh, pe people began to focus in the, in, in the mid seventies, people began to focus on the, on the idea of having a well-posed Cauchy problem. And um, I believe it was Garoche who came up essentially with the, with the following standard strong formulation of cosmic censorship. So cosmic censorship and bi bi bifurcated in the seventies. The weak cosmic, what was called weak cosmic censorship was, the, was a Penrose, Penrose's original idea, naked singularities has to be, have to be clothed behind event horizons. Strong cosmic censorship were claims about having well-posed Cauchy problems, well-posed initial value problems. So here's one example of an attempt to make the idea somewhat more precise to make it lend, so to lend itself per, hopefully to, uh, to proof of some kind. The maximal globally hyperbolic future developments of generic asymptotically flat initial data are future and extendable to regular Lorentzian manifolds. If that, sent, if that sentence doesn't make much sense to you, don't worry about it. The, 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 the essential idea is that we want to be, we want to ensure that when we specify reasonable initial data, general relativity guarantees that we can evolve it forward in time as far as it can possibly go with, with no pathologies arising that in some sense weren't already there in the initial data. This is very popular even to this day. And starting in the 90s, um, especially uh, uh, mathematical general relativists, ma mathematical physicists working in general re relativity began working on this like crazy and coming up with ever more refined formulations and ever more um, in, in ingenious methods of, of attempting to prove it, proving special cases, generalizing the special cases somewhat, someone would find a counterexample, they'd go back and reformulate the theorem. And th 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 there's basically a, a, a kind of a arms race between the, between the mathematical physicists who would try to re re refine the formulation and give a proof and the, and, and the the gadflies who would come up with counterexamples and show the mathematical physicists that they had to refine the reformulations. And that, that keeps on going to this day. There's, but there are other problems with, the, with this whole enterprise. First, it's anything remotely resembling a proof depends on assuming, uh, you, you, depends on assuming something uh, on some auxiliary conditions, like some kind of energy or causality conditions that themselves are as weakly supported or otherwise problematic as cosmic censorship itself. There's, as I already intimated, problems with the ambiguity of the inextendability of space-time. If you choose your reference class of space-times um, with respect to which the, your globally hyperbolic development is inextendable, if you choose your reference class judiciously, i.e. you cheat, you gerrymander, you can make your proofs very, you know, trivial almost. There's problems with making the idea of generic well-defined. You want generic well data, to, generic initial data to be um, well, uh, to be well behaved. There are some very, very serious problems with both 
mathematical and conceptual problems with making that idea precise. There are, and again, as I intimated, there are counterexamples have been found to essentially every precise, every precise formula to propose along these lines, leading to the weak, strong versions of cosmic censorship, which for instance, rule out only discontinuous extensions. Uh, I'll have something to say about why I find that problematic in a, in a, in a, in a little while. I'll just, I'll just mention a few, what to my mind, um, very uh, serious open conceptual problems. Several open and serious conceptual problems. Uh, yeah, I have to change that. I have to change that frame title. So, one, why focus? Why? What is the what is the motivation here? Why did, why is everyone and their mother working so sedulous, sedulously on cosmic censorship? To this day, if you ask. Most serious mathematical physicists working in general relativity, they'll, they'll tell you nothing has changed since, since, you know, Pen, since Penrose 1969. This is still the most important open problem in relativity. Why? Why focus on the unincernism rather than other forms of pathology? It's also, I, I think that to me at least, something has been lost in the transition from focus on what is now called the weak cosmic censorship singularities hidden behind event horizons of black holes and the current focus on strong cosmic censorship the initial value problem because general relativity in general relativity three plus one does not equal four the canonical formulation of general relativity the initial value problem is a very small subset of full four-dimensional relative uh, general relativity and to my mind it has a radically different conceptual structure anyway canonical general relativity is not general relativity and again, there are many different formulations of, of the strong form, not equivalent, all capturing subtly different conceptions, all, all with their own conceptual virtues and demerits. You know, which, which one should we choose? I got um, in, an interesting discussion I had recently with Ehrman and with Klaus Stansman. Uh, John, John sent us this beautiful list of different, of different ways one might try to formulate something like, this, something like the strong principle. And with this beautiful discussion of, uh, of, of why none of them really captures what you want captured. I'll, I think I'll try and get him to, to publish that. Why expect that one principle anyway will cover all the important cases? And, and what justifies Yerish to find such a thing in the first place? So why try to find the principle of cosmic censorship rather than several different propositions that make precise and capture different aspects of what we roughly and crudely have an idea we want? each relevant in its own context, but none applicable universally. I think that at, at bottom, there's an unrepentant and degenerate old Aristotelian essentialism that demands a single definition for what we use a single name for. Um, it, it really, it blows my mind that this, that this, uh, this urge, this impulse uh, still pervades uh, philosophy today so widely and so deeply and so thoughtlessly. But if, if you say, no, there's not a single canonical definition of, of X, you know, philosophers freak out. They, they, they want a single definition. If we use a single word, there must be a single, the right natural definition. Yeah. I, I, I never understood that. Yeah, why look for it in the first place? And what justifies yours to find such a thing? What reasons may we have for finding such a thing beyond the brute deliverance of entrenched physical theory, which we don't have, to expect such a proposition may hold. Well, there are three kinds of physical principles, at least for the purposes, for, the, for my recommended purposes right now, it is useful to divide physical principles up into three kinds. Those required by the physics for any of a number of several reasons, those required on pragmatic grounds for any of a, any of a number of, of reasons, and those desired for psychological comfort. So an example of those required by the physics would be perhaps, uh, we find that something conflicts with another prima facie of fundamental entrenched principle, maybe conservation of energy. So we, we need a principle that rules that out. Or we find that, that some kind of behavior blocks theoretical development. We're looking for quantum gravity, you know, space times that behave like this, we can't quantize them. Let's get a principle that rules them out. Or pragmatic grounds. Well, certain kinds of behavior conflicts with how we like to do physics, predictability based on initial value problems, for example. 
or perhaps certain by, kinds of behavior makes modeling systems difficult. So we rule those out on pragmatic grounds because we don't know how to deal with them. Or their desire for psychological comfort you know, conflicts with how we like to do physics. Aesthetic grounds, fear of unpredictability, neurotic Cartesian phobia of uncertainty. Well, as far as I can see, the demand for cosmic censorship as the ethically evaluative flavor of its name suggests. And remember Pen 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 Penrose's pointed uh, use of kind of prurient slash uh, uh, puritanical language in, in describing the idea in the, in the first place in 1969. And as the connection with determinism shows, I think the demand for cosmic censorship arises from both pragmatic and psychological grounds. It doesn't arise from anything physical that I can see. In sum, we have an example of a sizable subculture in physics working on matters that have no clearly or even unambiguously defined physical parameters to inform the investigations, have no empirical evidence to guide or even to constrain them, have the parameters of the debate imposed by and large by the intuitions of a handful of leading researchers. From sociological, physical, and physical, philosophical vantage points, one may well wonder why so many physicists can to work on it and what sort of investigation they are engaged in. You have 52 years of cosmic censorship, and still we do not know what it is or why we should care. Now, I, I want, after that rather inflammatory tirade, I do want to take a step back and be a little more calm and measured for a moment and say that I don't want me, I don't mean to imply at all that the, that the current mathematical work being done on the initial value for formulation is not interesting and important in and of itself. It's actually very beautiful work and very interesting in many ways. It's just not clear to me that the attempt to resolve the problem of cosmic censorship ought to be what frames and motivates all my work. Like for instance, the, to my mind, unhealthy obsession with differential with differentiability class extensions. I mean, can it possibly make a physical difference whether a metric is C11 but not C2 extendable? To take what is these days a rather tame example, especially given that no one expects general relativity to be a final theory anyway. So I'm not trying to say that all these mathematical physicists are just are, are just wrong or mistaken or silly or foolish. They're not. This is very beautiful, important, deep work mathematically that's being done. It's just not clear to me. What it all comes to, what it all comes to physically. So, Jacob, I think I have about seven minutes left. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Excellent. So, I might blow, I might blow through some things pretty quickly because I'm taking longer than I planned. Uh, so. I'm now going to talk about singularities and cosmic censorship very briefly in the in the setting of semi-classical gravity. Semi-classical gravity is, for the purposes of this talk, is uh, the, the framework in which one has a classical background space-time geometry and quantum fields propagating uh, um, against that geometry. And the stress energy content of these quantum fields couples with the classical space-time geometry in exactly in a way one might naively expect, according to what's called the semi-classical Einstein field equation, classical Einstein tensor on the left, expectation value of these of the quantum operator representing the stress energy tensor of the quantum field on the right. This framework has many fascinating mathematical, physical, conceptual, physical, philosophical problems, but uh, sadly, but expeditiously, we must ignore them all. I will just remark, this is the framework within which essentially all work in black hole thermodynamics is done. The der uh, derivations of um, Hawking radiation, black hole evaporation, arguments about the information loss paradox, this all happens here. The first thing to remark is that semi-classical gravity I mean, promiscuously with the joyous abandon violates every energy condition under the sun. But every energy, every singularity theorem, and in fact, essentially every, every theorem about black holes in general, all depend on the assumption of one of these energy conditions. So when we move into semi-classical gravity, do we just lose every single important theorem that we use in, in classical relativity in studying these kinds of space times? Do we, for instance, lose the singularity theorems to semi-classical gravity? Should, should we not worry about singularities? Do we not need a, a theory of quantum gravity to efface singularities for us? Because it already happens in, in semi-classical gravity. The violation of the energy conditions shows that 
we don't that we shouldn't expect singularities here. Well, not so fast. Um, Aaron Wall in 2013 proved a very beautiful theorem in which he essentially, uh, in which he argues that even though there are no energy conditions that one cannot rely on uh, these quantum, on quantum fields in semi-classical gravity obeying any of the energy conditions, one still can use the, the machinery of black hole thermodynamics itself to prove singularity theorems. So Wall's theorem says, suppose there exists a globally hyperbolic space-time with a quantum trapped surface. This is a, a quantum trapped surface is a kind of causal structure that Aaron uh, defines in the paper. For our purposes, you can just think of it as a certain kind of null surface with a semi-classical entropy on the defined on the null surface decreasing to the future. So intuitively, it's a it's like it, it's the it's the semi-classical version of Penrose's uh, trapped surface. It's a it's like a null surface that is shrinking. Let the semi-classical approximation be valid near T, but not necessarily elsewhere. Then the fine-grained generalized second law requires that space-time is not null to be complete. So black hole thermodynamics itself seems to require that space-time space times be singular. So no, no, nothing in semi-classical gravity it seems like will save us. There are a couple of other um, really interesting results um, along the same lines. I just mentioned three of three. There, there, there are several more. People have just re just very recently really started to work in this area. There's a lot of really cool, interesting stuff happening. Um, I, I don't have time to talk about it all. This, this probably could have been a talk all by itself. But I'll just I'll mention the, these three. I urge you to go, uh, both philosophers and physicists alike. I urge you to, to go check this out and, and related papers, because there's there is just an en enormous amount of interesting conceptual work that needs that is crying out to be done on uh, 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 about this stuff. Okay, so in my last four minutes, let us take stock of where we are and, well, let's just do that, okay. So where does this leave us? Well, I wanna talk about the sense in which, if any, we can, make, we can make precise the idea that singularities mark the breakdown of general relativity. And I think it's first important to remark, which is, a an incredibly simple and straightforward observation, but one that people don't see, don't, I think, make often enough and don't think about often enough, is what is the role of the Einstein field equation in all of this? Well, for all the classical singularity theorems, I claim none. The Einstein field equation plays no role whatsoever. And I mean that in the very strong sense. You can assume the logical negation of the Einstein field equation and you can still derive all these singularity theorems. There's a subtlety about Wall's theorem that um, is really quite interesting, but uh, it, it depends on how one interprets the GSL for uh, whether it depends on the semi-classical Einstein field equation. That's beyond the scope of this talk. You can ask me about it, I guess, during question and answer if you like. So what is the actual role of the Einstein field equation? I claim it doesn't, it provides the physical interpretation of the geometrical structures that are used in the, in the proof of the theorem. The, the logical form of all of these arguments are, Assume condition on some geometrical object, Einstein tensor, Ricci, Ricci tensor, or something else. Derive a mathematical theorem. Invoke the Einstein field equation to give a physical interpretation of the condition assumed in step one and the result derived in step two. That's all. But if the singularity theorems don't depend on the Einstein field equation, in what sense can they mark a breakdown of general relativity itself? What actually breaks down, if anything, if, 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 what actually breaks down, if anything, is the idea of Lorentzian geometry, not general relativity itself. But it's difficult to make this precise because in a singular space-time, after all, a singular space-time is everywhere, by definition, a well-defined Lorentzian manifold. There is no point at which any geometrical structure breaks down in a space-time, by definition. I think there's an illuminating comparison here. Um, to look at what people talk about with break, breakdown of other, of what we think of as an effective or higher level theory. So think about the divergence of kinetic energy terms. That should be kinetic energy terms, not times. 
in a finite time in solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. That really is a breakdown of the theory. That really is a breakdown of the definition of the terms of the theory because the kinetic energy terms become ill-defined at, at a determinate point of space at a determined instant of time. There's a background space-time structure with respect to which I can talk about the kinetic energy term blowing up. And there's actually a, a point in space and a point in time where the kinetic energy becomes infinite. That's a real breakdown. Of course, general relativity depends on Lorentzian geometry, but the breakdown here, if any, does not come from the Einstein field equation itself, but rather generic features of Lorentzian geometry, such as the Rachel-Dury equation. So the breakdown, if there is one, seems to be conditions for the definition of structures required for the formulation of the theory no longer apply, or perhaps since the Einstein field equation only gives physical interpretation to conditions on the Ricci tensor, breakdown is in the possibility of giving, of giving physical inter interpretation of geometrical structures in the conceptual terms of the theory. And in any event, when a Ricci curvature patholo uh, pathology is involved, that may mark a breakdown of the theory of matter at issue, but not necessarily, again, anything having to do with general relativity per se. Well, let me pass on that. So the, given that various measures of curvature or derivatives of cur curvature grow without bound along certain short curves may bother us psychologically, and they may, that may even be wrong as a prediction of GR. But that does not necessarily mean the theory has broken down in any interesting sense. It may have just made a bad prediction. Now, it may be that this particular bad prediction, if it be one, that, there, that there's an incomplete and extendable curve, say, is, is fruitfully understood as indicating a regime where the effects of phenomena not treated by GR, uh, quant, for instance, quantum or thermodynamically non-equilibrium behavior of some geometrical structure, become non-negligible compared to the scales of which general relativity is appropriately applied and predictably accurate, accurate, but it may not. Compare Newtonian mechanics applied to bodies with arbitrarily high velocities. I think this is not fruitfully understood as a case in which the theory breaks down, even though some quantities, for instance, linear momentum and kinetic energy grow without bound. I think it is rather that the theory makes bad predictions and we now have one special relativity that, that does a better job. So, what I mean by breakdown here is the theory is no longer appropriately applied. It fails to have the conceptual or mathematical resources needed to construct a model of the system at issue that can be checked for predictive accuracy. So if, if singularities herald a breakdown of general relativity, then it means that as a theory, it does not have the conceptual or mathematical resources needed to model the relevantly quantum or thermodynamically non-equilibrium behavior that X hypothesis manifests in regions where general relativity predicts strong curvature but that has nothing to do with singularities. And if classical curvature blow up heralds the need to use funky quantum structures to model a region of space time that we should note, then ipso facto, any classical curve that enters that region will be incomplete and inextendable according to general relativity. So what exactly is this promise of singularity resolution by quantum gravity anyway? Carlo, I'm talking to you. So maybe there really are naked singularities and they spew out old socks and TVs playing Nixon's checker speech. And if so, then we know that their behavior will not be governed by general relativity. But we could then begin to investigate their behavior as we would any other initially strange physical system to see whether we can find laws that describe them. Groovy new physics. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric, for a wonderful talk. So we did go just a couple of minutes over, but we have a five or six minutes uh, for questions. I do want to make sure to give people a, a few minute, a few minutes of break before our next talk. So please uh, raise your hand, or if you'd again like to ask a question in the chat, please feel free to do so. I'll try to call people roughly in the order in which they've asked, but again, I'll try to be mindful of ensuring that everybody has a chance to ask questions. The first hand I see is from Alex. Alex, unmute and go ahead. Thanks so much. I learned a lot from uh, your talk. I guess um, you kind of addressed this at the end, but you made this taxonomy into physical, uh, pragmatic, and psychological. And it seemed to me like there might be at least one more sort of category there, something like non-self undermining. So I'm thinking of the example of Boltzmann brains, where you know you have a theory that predicts Boltzmann brains. It doesn't seem like that could be ruled out physically or for maybe maybe for pragmatic reasons, but the real problem is like, if you actually believed a theory that predicted Boltzmann brains, then you would be led to no longer believe the evidence for your theory. 
And so that would sort of in some kind of strange, slightly unusual way undermine the theory. And so I was wondering, um, I don't know enough about cosmic censorship, but if somebody could argue on those kinds of grounds for the hypothesis and, and sort of deny that it's just psychological or practical. That's a, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, so I, I, um, I would, so uh, let me grant for the sake of argument, first of all, that Boltzmann brains are in some sense self-undermining. I don't think that's nearly so obvious or clear as a lot, as a lot of people seem to claim. But let, 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 let me grant that for the sake of argument that even if not that, that there is, that there is an idea of a theory as being self-undermining in something like that way. I don't see how um, singularities um, at all do that. First of all, I, I really like the example of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is, is a naked singularity, it's visible. And yet it, it has not stopped us from applying general relativity in extraordinarily powerful, accurate, uh, predictably fruitful, conceptually fruitful ways to model you know, uh, the large scale structure and uh, uh, cosmologically. So singularities by themselves cannot be, un cannot be undermining of general relativity. So you, more has to be said. I think if, if one wants to try and use, to try and go that route argumentatively. Nothing I see off the top of my head stops one from trying to make that argument, but I don't see off the top of my head how, how it would go. Thanks. Uh, next I have Carlo. Um, thank you, Jacob. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, uh, nice talk. A lot of things I agree, a lot of things which are new to me and I, I found uh, uh, interesting and convincing. <coughs> One specific point, um, which is historical, but is relevant to your, to your overall point about cosmic censorship. Um, what you gave is a usual uh, sort of account of, uh, of Penrose's motivations, but I don't think it's the right account of Penrose's motivation. Um, uh, I think there is a better story. There is a beautiful paper by Klaus Lanz um, um, appearing on Foundation of Physics on, 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 on the history. Um, I think this way, uh, Penrose just got the Nobel Prize uh, uh, very uh, appropriately. Um, but the usual story is that he got the Nobel Prize because he proved that black holes are generic. Now, strictly speaking, this is wrong, of course, uh, because uh, we can define black holes in many ways, but uh, uh, what we mean essentially is that there's some kind of horizon for black holes. And uh, uh, Penrose did not prove that horizons are generic. Penrose proved uh, that singularities are generic under suitable conditions. But he, what he wanted to prove <clears throat> is that black holes are generic so that um, uh, horizons are generic. So he missed one thing to where he wanted to go. And what he missed is that if there is a singularity, then there is a black, there is a horizon. And that's a cosmic censorship motivation for Penrose. It's not that, oh, uh, you know, uh, singularities are bad. So we, the, 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 we only can, there should be some principle or something in the theory that tell us that we can only accept that they're, they're hidden. The point is that he had, a, he, he had these strong theorems that under generic condition um, black holes form, which what people did not think at the time people suspected uh, the, the uh, central singularity was just a, a uh, something due to, to the specific symmetry of that solution. He proved that wrong and proved that the singularity is uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's generic. So he needed some extra point, some extra step to go from singularities to... Um, uh, to... Now, if you look at this from this perspective, uh, searching if there is constant censorship actually implemented by the Einstein equations, which has failed in some sense so far, it's a perfectly reasonable enterprise because you want to prove that generically there are, there are horizons, um, which has nothing to do with the current idea which you correctly described uh, that something should uh, save us from naked singularities. Um, that's it's just a historical comment, but I think it's relevant to interpreting, and, and it goes in your sense. Uh, th th thank you for that. So I, um, I, I, I basically, I basically agree with you entirely. And uh, by the way, since you mentioned Klaus's paper, I will go ahead and and, uh, and give it another, another shout out. I strongly encourage every everyone to read it. It's a it's a beautiful paper. It was actually um, I was having a conversation with Klaus and with John Ehrman about. Klaus's paper, and he he actually in, in that paper I, I should I should also say 
he gives a really beautiful discussion of how, so he claims, so he argues, the Penrose's original mo motivation for what's now called weak cosmic censorship and the, the initial value problem, what's now called strong cosmic censorship, are much more intimately connected than I may, than I, I may have uh, suggested in, in this talk. But Carlo, I think, um, I think your, your history, I, 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 I absolutely agree with you, I, but I would, and perhaps, but I would wanna add one more statement, which you may not agree with, which is the reason why, so I agree, Penrose, Penrose's motivation was he wanted to prove that this, a certain kind of horizon was generic. But I think at least not, not the entire motivation, but part of the motivation for him was still to try to preserve um, a, a certain kind of predictability or, or determinism. You may not agree with that. Uh, <clears throat> you can ask Roger. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> just, I just wanted to point out that this is the other side of the story. We, we, we agree over that. But, but on the reasonability of the other side of the story, I think we both agree. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you're absolutely right about that. And what but, you said about the point not being, the point about the mutation of GR is not that singularity is unreasonable, it's just that we expect something else to come in. I, of course, you're, I'm, I'm entirely with you here. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, thanks to everyone with questions. Um, I see that there's still a couple of hands up. Um, we're going to have to pause on those questions. So. Uh, if you had uh, additional questions, please hang on to those until uh, the final hour. We'll have a, a general question and answer period. I want to get things set up for um, our next speaker, who's going to be Mina. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank uh, Eric again for a wonderful talk. So thanks again, Eric. And I want to give everyone you know, a minute or two. So take two minutes, everybody, and, and take a brief break. Uh, and while that's happening, uh, Lydia, if you could, if you could uh, get your slides up. I'm sorry. 